Our first speaker for tonight is Cecilia Wood. Um, she's a PhD student in economics at the London School of Economics, and her research focuses on using techniques from economic theory, especially mechanism design, to AI safety. And she'll be telling us about Beyond VNM, self-modification and reflective stability. Cecilia, you could take it away. Great, thank you. Um, let me share. Okay, great. Um, so thanks to PID um, for sponsoring this project um, and to my mentor for this project with David Dalrymple. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is some of the things that I've been thinking about over the summer, some of the work that I've done. Um, in particular, I'm I'm really asking about self-modifications, um, reflective stability, and then saying, well, actually, this is a bigger space than just what we normally think of as like very standard VNM. Even when we're looking at an idealized agent setting with no computational constraints, this is still there's still a lot more there than just VNM. So let's start from a kind of we need any safety feature to be robust to deliberate self-modification. A lot of the work that's being done in AI safety at the moment looks like, okay, if we're in this situation, let's add this, this safety feature and this makes us more robust to these kind of situations. And then if we're in these situations, we also want this safety feature or this safety feature. And so we've kind of building up these levels of safety. Um, what we want is that if we're adding all these different things, we don't want it to be the case. It better not be the case that if an AI, advanced AI was ever able to re-optimize the way that they're thinking about decisions, the way they're making the decisions, that they immediately get rid of some of these safety features. If that, this is the case, these are not safety features that we should be relying on. So let's kind of look at the most powerful thing we can think of and then work backwards from there. So starting, all I'm showing you today is this very toy model in an idealized agent setting, no computational constraints, where we just assume that you can change your, your decision-making process. So starting from like the most powerful thing, we're in the most danger of kind of, it might not be reflectively stable. And that's what I'm using um, to kind of mean things that will persist under self-modification. Um, yeah, the kind of the most powerful agent that we can think of. And really emphasizing that if if we're looking at the space that's robust to self-modification, deliberate self-modification, this is bigger than VNM, just VNM utility theory. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk very briefly just to kind of frame what I'm talking about. Um, and the way that I've been thinking about this is that utility functions are more general than reward functions. I'm not thinking of when I'm saying utility function, I'm using a U or a V and I'm saying, okay, this is how it's making decisions. I'm not saying it's literally written in the code or there's some set of reward functions and maybe it chooses this one or this one. And this is kind of the thing that it has written within it somewhere. All I'm saying is that if we're looking at advanced AI, then, or even AI as we have it now, it's making decisions. It has a list of possible actions. Maybe this is a list of predictions it could make on the world. Maybe we've delegated actions, so it's taking actions, it's moving through the world. But it has a list of action space or choices or policy spaces, and then it's saying this one. This is the choice that I'm making. As soon as you do this, you can represent it as a choice function. And under kind of fairly simple um, and very well-defined assumptions, we can move between this choice function to kind of a preference ordering over states of the world, or here I'm just doing a preference ordering over policies, over actions. Um, similarly, we could also represent it by a utility function. Um, it's just a very mathematically convenient. I'm not saying that like literally this is the utility function that it has it written in. I'm just saying, well, I want to represent the way it makes decisions. Here I'm going to represent it as a utility function. There are some, um, some assumptions behind this. Um, but I think it's it's a very general framework to think about this. And I want you to be thinking more than just uh, the kind of reward functions that we're used, used to and more thinking about, okay, it makes decisions in some way and we observe some behavior and we're interested in predicting that behavior and saying something about how it's making, uh, whether it's going to continue making that uh, those decisions in a consistent way. Okay, this is the machinery I'm using, the kind of very simple toy model that I'm going to build up. So. Let's start with the policy space. These are the things that you can choose from, the things that you have available to you. We're assuming compact just to ensure that there is at least something that's optimal. 
Um, we have a state space. This is just representing the world, what the world looks like over the agent's representation, internal representation of the world. Maybe we have some utility function that says, okay, I have preferences over these states of the world. But actually a lot of this, I'm just gonna wrap up and say, okay, rather than saying you have preferences over utility functions, depending on how your, sorry, preferences over state spaces, depending on how you're evaluating this, kind of what kind of um, like probability um, decision theory are you using, we can kind of wrap it up as just preferences over action, preferences over policies. So let's say you maximize over your policy pi, some phenol, and this is what you wake up day one uh, or day zero, you start with some preference ranking, so, um, over policies, and I'm representing this by being zero. If we're in standard VNN utility function, this is going to look like, well, the expected utility of a state given some action, where an action induces a distribution over states. And then I look at the expected utility and take the expected utility over all these possible um, states conditional on your action and I choose the highest action. Okay. In terms of timing, I'm doing this for the sake of this 25 minutes. Uh, I'm doing a very simple two time period model. Um, you wake up time zero, you say, well, do I want to change the way that I think about the world? Do I want to change the way I make decisions, the way I choose my policy? So in T zero, I choose maybe any V1 to replace V naught if I want to. And I kind of have complete flexibility over this. It just needs to be a mapping from the policy space to the real numbers. And then in T1, my future self is going to go off and choose the policy according to this new V1 that T0 self has chosen for it. Um, it's really simple to extend this or to represent this in continuous time instead. Um, maybe you might assume some small time epsilon that it takes you to change your um, your decision making process. All this is going to do is strengthen my results because it's going to introduce a cost. Maybe if it, it's costing you this time that you could be doing something else, that's just going to strengthen my results. So for the sake of this, it's we're going to leave it in the, the two period. Very simple, but it's not a substantive assumption. Um, I do have this tiny little assumption um, at the end. So if there's more than one optimal pi, if the space of things that I'm happy to choose, the policies that I'm happy to choose in T0, um, it's kind of bigger than just one, if it's not unique, I'm going to assume that my future self is going to choose any of them with some probability. So it's gonna randomize with full support. And it might be that it chooses my favorite one. If I, it's gonna rule out things like, I make my future self indifferent over all policies, but I trust that it's going to choose my favorite policy. I mean, it might change it, choose your favorite policy, but it might, I don't know, slip, make a mistake and choose something else because it's indifferent, it's no reason not to. So we're gonna rule out those kind of conditions by just assuming that it makes it with full support over anything that is in its optimal policy set. It just makes our math a little bit more convenient. OK. Um, so we have this mapping V between policies and the real numbers. Now, I gave you a couple of assumptions already. But as soon as we write this down, we already have implicit assumptions going on. So V is not a function of time. So this agent that I've written down is dynamically consistent. It's not the case that if I do nothing, tomorrow self will have a different ordering over preference over policies than today's self will. It's really trivial to extend this. Um, if you have an agent that's dynamically inconsistent, I, it's going to think differently about the policy ordering, the preference ordering over policies tomorrow than today. All I do is go, all I'm going to want to do is change that so that it becomes dynamically consistent. I do this in one period and we're back to this model. So it's a not substantive assumption. It's just for to keep this really nice and simple and easy. A more substantive assumption is that V doesn't affect the world directly. So the way that I've set it up is you have some way of making decisions. This affects your action pi, which then affects uh, states of the world, like probability it induces a poly dis poly uh, probability distribution over states of the world. Uh, which is this omega. There is no direct link between my preferences, the agent's internal preferences, and the state of the world directly, except through this channel of choosing actions. What this rules out is 
kind of those situations, those um, examples where you get a very powerful agent and it comes over to you and it says, okay, I can make the world exactly as you want it. You just need to change your preferences a little bit. And I go, sure, absolutely. This is absolutely what I want. Uh, where we get kind of, obviously we get an agent wanting to change their their preferences because we've kind of baked it into it. So we're ruling those kind of cases out. We might be worried about um, that an agency, we might be worried about things like um, commitment races or I mean, just game theory in general. Think about game theory, my preferences in equilibrium. Um, everybody has true beliefs over my preferences or maybe a probability distribution over my preferences. This changes what action they expect me to take and therefore what action they take. So actually, if they, if I could credibly change my preferences and show them, they would take a different action and that might be better for me. Like commitment races, I would love to show that I'm committed to some, um, some action to stop somebody else from doing it instead. Here, it's not that I want to change my preferences. All I want to do is change the other player's beliefs over what my preferences are, their beliefs over what my actions are. So it's not ruling out anything. This framework is not ruling out anything around like building reputation or costly signaling. If there's some commitment device in the world, like some contract I can sign, absolutely I can do this. What it does rule out is situations where maybe interpretability goes really well and I can show you, I can make myself transparent and I can show you exactly what my preferences are, what this fee is. So I'm kind of ruling out this to kind of get rid of those cases where it's explicitly dependent on making myself transparent and making myself very visible in a way that I kind of, I would like you to, in, to induce a belief change in you, but still keep my preferences. And I'm just ruling those cases out. Um, I think there's some interesting questions there, um, but for the sake of this, I'm kind of leaving them. Okay. Uh, quickly, let's define reflective stability. All I'm meaning is kind of what persists under self-modification. So something, some function V, I start with some V, is weakly reflectively stable. If keeping that V is an optimal action, maybe there are other things that I'm happy to, but at least keeping this V is an optimal action. Strong reflective stability. I mean, this is the only thing that I want. Um, there is nothing, or in particular, no other preference ordering that I want to change to. And I've defined this a little bit more formally here. Now, any safety feature which is not at least weakly reflectively stable will not persist under self-modification. So we really need, this is the minimum we need in any safety feature is weak reflectively, uh, weak reflective stability. Anything that's not strongly reflectively stable is not guaranteed to. So maybe it's happy to uh, keep the safety feature. Maybe it might get rid of it. It's, it's indifferent. And so this is potentially a problem if we want to guarantee this. Given an idealized agent with dynamically consistent preferences, we start with some policy, uh, some decision-making process, like, like some ranking V0, where V0 can't directly the world uh, affect the world. Any V0 is weakly reflectively stable. Any way that I want to evaluate the world, any way I want to rank policies, anything is weakly reflectively stable. That is choosing V1 equal to V0 as an optimal action. We can prove this formally, but all I'm really saying is if I want to change the way I think about things, or the reason why I'd want to change it is to affect how my future self makes decisions. And I want my future self to be consistent with my present self, which means that all I want to do is just give my future self my, my current preferences and so that this persists. But maybe let's talk about strong reflective stability. This might be a little bit harder. Okay. I have a couple of examples that I wanted to talk about. Um, by soft optimization, what I mean is we throw a bunch of optimization power at a problem or at a, at a goal, at a proxy that is almost right. And then AI is very aggressively optimizing for it. This seems dangerous. We can apply something like Goodhart's law to say, okay, if we optimize for a proxy, the kind of canonical economics example is okay, GDP is good for human flourishing until we start to aggressively maximize for GDP. And then we get things that are good for GDP, but not good for human flourishing. So the more we aggressively, we optimize it, the more the kind of a goal and a proxy come apart. So if this is the case, maybe we want to kind of optimize for something, but not quite as aggressively. as like full, um, like maximizing, really aggressively maximizing. And this is kind of more of a problem, the more powerful agents we're taking into consideration. Um, one example in practice that's kind of 
being considered is quantilizers. Um, so consider one way of writing this down might be V naught is, well, the minimum of some expected utility of a state given some action and some constant alpha, where alpha we're like capping out on expected utility, like this is enough. To work kind of a, a toy example to make this a bit more tangible, think about um, maybe my expected utility is my chance of success at a goal. So my expected utility is between zero and one, one if I get my goal, zero if I don't, um, and alpha is like 0.9. Right. I just want to cap out at like 90 percent probability of getting my goal is enough. Right. That's really good. I want to be indifferent over everything above that. There's still a lot of scary stuff in that that top 10 percent. Um, but at least we're not guaranteed to end up at the scary bit. So we're just adding an extra safety layer here. Note that this is not the same as satisfying. And I've kind of written out how you might write out each of these. Satisfying, right, if we take our very favorite paperclip, silly paperclip example, if I'm saying create 100 paperclips, so I'm satisfying, like, once you're at 100 paperclips, tap out, then you're done. If you have uncertainty over this, well, maybe you might want to take more and more aggressive actions to move from 95% chance of getting 100 paperclips to 98% chance to 99 to 99.999. And then you end up looking like a maximizer because with a little bit of uncertainty, you still want to take these more and more aggressive actions. Here we're saying 99.9999, we don't need that. Like 90, 95, tap out, then you're done. Okay. We already know that writing a V like this from the last slide is weakly reflectively stable. So if we write a V like this, it's it, it the AI is willing to keep this kind of framework, this uh, this way of ranking policies. However, as soon as you in, uh, have a V naught that induces an optimal policy with more than one optimal policy, as soon as you have indifference, it's not strongly reflectively stable, essentially, because if I'm indifferent, my present self is indifferent between A and B, policy A and policy B. If my future self strictly prefers A over B. Well, I was happy with A and it's going to choose A. So I'm completely happy with this. Note that as soon as I do change, as soon as I my future self changes to strictly prefer A over B, it will want, not want to make its future selves move back. It will always want to prefer A over B. So any change, any such change is irreversible. And this seems dangerous. Not only do you, could you lose the safety feature, but once you lose it, it's gone forever. Maybe we have a solution. Uh, one one thing, all we need is to break this indifference, right? If I'm indifferent between losing it or not, I know it's weakly reflectively stable. Like I'm willing to keep the safety feature. I'm just not guaranteed to. All you need is to break that indifference. So adding some penalty term for changing or even a computational cost. If it takes me half a second just to modify my code a bit, this is enough to break the indifference. And now I don't want to change my preferences. Maybe this is less of a problem than we thought it was. OK, quickly talk about my second example. Um, this is now I want to talk more about um, going beyond v &M and being really explicit around okay, thinking about this framework captures more than just v &M utility, uh, utility theory. So we have this nice example that I've stolen from Gibbo and Samuelson paper from last year. Um, imagine there's two states of the world, right? We have to corresponding to long run effects of global warming. So something that we're really uncertain about how it's gonna play out. Not only do I not know the probability of being in like the first state or the second state, all these vectors correspond to, okay, if I take action X1, then I get one in this first state, I get zero in the second state and so on. Um, maybe I don't know the probability of being in this first state or being in the second state. If Note that here, these, these numbers, and it's just a toy example, are in utils, not in um, not in money. So if we're thinking about, okay, but you could add risk aversion. Risk aversion is already baked into this. this these numbers already take into account any risk aversion. But the problem with this is if I really don't know the utility, and maybe if I really don't know the probabilities, maybe it could be anywhere between like 30% and 70% of getting being in the first state versus the second state. It, it, like if I take 
uh, nothing is going to be able to, if I just use expected utility framing, I can't justify X2 as a decision. However, if I were looking at credo sets, so if I say, okay, I don't know exactly the probability, but I know it's somewhere between 30 and 70, then one way that I could look at it is say, well, what's the worst case under all these different um, outcomes? So the expected utility given it's 30%, the expected utility given it's 70% and everything in between. If I wanted to say, okay, given I have some range of probabilities rather than just a single probability. So in this framing, it's often called ambiguity um, to kind of separate it from uncertainty. Maybe I say, okay, what's the best worst case? Um, and we could write it like this. It's been written several ways. I thought this was the simplest way to write it. This approach fully axiomized, axiomatized by Gilbor and Smeitler this, in this Maxman paper. But note that it's not, it's broader than BNM. And if we compare this to our model, we can just change it to be some V. Right, we don't need the way that you evaluate states of the world to use VNM. We could use something much broader. Um, and actually, I think I'm going to finish early. Um, that's kind of all that I wanted to cover just for the section. So, starting with this framework where you just say, okay, if I want to consider how an agent makes decisions. So I'm starting with some V and it's, it's kind of ranking policies. It has a preference over policies. And we're, so we're just mapping V from policies to the real numbers and underlying that maybe it's expected utility and maybe it's um, Gilbert Smidler's maximum framework using credo sets. Starting with this, we're in an idealized agent that can completely self-modify this V. So it's decision-making process, the way it's choosing between different policies. Starts off dynamically consistent. This is just convenience. We could extend it to dynamically inconsistent agents as well. Where V does not directly affect the world, then everything is weakly reflectively stable. Anything goes. Like, this is much bigger space than VNM, as we've seen from the last example. Also, the anything that induces indifference. I mean, it really matters at the top where you're saying your optimal policy set is bigger than just one thing, but in general, any indifference anywhere over policies is not going to be strongly reflectively stable because you can induce, you can say, okay, now make yourself strictly prefer one to the other and take these preference, this preference ordering forward instead. Maybe we can get around this by either explicitly having a penalty term for changing or just by saying, well, in the real world, you have some tiny computational cost for changing it and that's enough to deter because all we need to do is break indifference. Um, and that's me. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, here's like a virtual round of applause. Um, let's wait just one or two minutes to see if we get any questions. Um, so we still have some time for the Q&A. If not, my first question would be, um, so you've told us here about kind of this preference ranking over policies um, that can change over time. Um, how would you put this in the context of kind of the AI systems that we see today? Is it Would you kind of <clears throat> consider like reinforcement learning agents um, who can kind of like change their own reward function or have like some intrinsic motivation component? Would that be like an analogy or yeah, how do you build on this framework when it comes to kind of designing modern day systems? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I had an interesting conversation recently uh, about something like this. Um, I think one perspective is to say, well, as soon as you're, as when you're running, when you're training an AI and it's going through and figuring out well, how to view the world, what variables to use, um, how to kind of categorize the world, how to build a state space. Um, you're already in some way trying to optimize your own decision making. You're already saying, OK, if I frame it this way, does this work better? Does this predict better? And that's kind of building in to this how I evaluate policies. Um, the, the counter example, the counter argument to this is maybe saying, OK, you have two levels. You have this kind of the way that the algorithm is kind of telling you how the training process should run. Um, maybe this requires an AI to optimize over that bit as well. Um, 
which is possible but I also feel like uh you could argue that maybe the best day like as soon as you make an argument like if you as soon as the the, the best AI will be built by AI then you get into these issues as well um so it feels very very relevant for like okay how should we train an AI if you're then giving that process to an AI and saying okay how should you make decisions then this starts to look a lot closer to this already um so this doesn't feel very futuristic to me this this feels tangible and close um it feels like this in the same way that building a more and more powerful AI is going to have economic incentives, making an AI able to optimize itself also feels like the strong economic economic incentives to get there. Thanks. Um, we have a question from the chat uh, by John Mori. Seems like a useful aspect of self-modification is committing in extensive form games to implement Nash equilibrium instead of sub-game perfect Nash equilibria. Is this something you've thought about? And if so, could you speak to it? And then there's a note by changing your preferences of the outcomes in the sub game you don't want to enter. Yeah, so um, this was kind of what I was pointing to, or one of the things I was thinking about when thinking about, um, yeah, this, this V doesn't affect the world directly and what you're giving up by making this assumption. Um, I think when I think about these, we, as soon as you assume Nash, you assume that everybody has true beliefs over everybody else's utility function, or everybody else's preferences, how everybody else is making decisions. Um, in those situations, I don't want to change my preferences. All I want to do is change my your belief over my preferences. Now, if you can do that credibly, or if you can, maybe if you could fool somebody and say, okay, yeah, sure, I've changed my preferences. Look at this, like this mask that I'm showing you and I've changed my preferences. This is great. And you would absolutely want to do that. And that's kind of the best for you. You don't want to change your preferences. These are um, possibly fragile. Maybe you have more uncertainty in the future. Um, so holding onto your preferences seems like it has value. All you want to do is change the way other people think. And if you break that assumption that uh, you have to have true beliefs, as we assume in Nash, then yeah, this is absolutely what you want to do. You want to be able to fool people and say that. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how um, how reliant on the like the way that we think about game theory this kind of thing is. So that's what I'm also kind of pointing out when I'm saying you rule out interpretability going well. So yes, I would love to credibly commit and say sure, these are my preferences. And so then the question is like, how likely do we think that agents will be able to credibly commit and credibly visibly show um, that my preferences have changed? Because obviously as soon as you can do that, if interpretability goes really well, if I can change my preferences in a way that doesn't have like a tiny piece of code snuck down to the side that says, okay, these are mostly my preferences, but I'm gonna revert back using this bit of code. Um, then yes, we should absolutely revisit this. Um, and yeah, we can come up with lots of examples where in order to get commitment, I want to change my preferences. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much.